if you're a born again, spirit filled believer, then the Bible says that we are the sons and the daughters of God. Amen. And if you're the sons and daughters of God, that's a great place to be. Being sons and daughters of God, it just allows so many privileges and so many opportunities. And it's so good to be in that space because, you know, there's just so much that Scripture tells us is available to us. Being joined heirs with Jesus Christ. Can you, can you imagine what that means in the spiritual context? It's a pretty big deal, isn't it? And so as believers, um, we have a lot of God-given things in our lives. Amen. And um, the Bible also says that when we, when we come into Christ, we become a new creation. And when you're a new creation, the old is gone. The old is dead, buried, and under the ground. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we are not meant to live under the ground Amen. because we're a new creation above ground. Amen. Only dead things get buried, live things live. Amen. Is that right? Yeah. I'm just seeing if you're all with me this morning. Hallelujah. So we're living in resurrection power. So being in Christ and being in God, uh, we, have, we have been blessed with so much. We've been blessed with, with breath. We can breathe. We've been blessed with hope and faith and power and grace and love and, 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 and so many things that we have in God. But one thing that has really just struck in my heart and the Lord been challenging me on this all week is we often understand what we have in God, but we don't often understand the responsibility and the accountability that goes with it. And... Um, I want to touch a little bit on this because we can live our daily life, but unless we have a mind to understand the, the judgment seat of Christ, there is something missing in the way we live our Christianity. You know, some Christians er errant, errantly, by mistake, believe that the way you live your life doesn't matter, and we will never be asked to give an account of how we lived. Now, this is not true. This is not true. And I think this is one of the biggest lies that has been spread in Christianity over this time because what's happened is people start to think that I can do whatever I like and it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. It does matter. But Nico, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. That stuff's all in the Old Testament. I beg to differ. It's not. It's New Testament. It's real to us today. In fact, the Bible will have us believe that how we live and how we give and how we present ourselves is very much important in the life in Christ. I notice it's gone very quiet in the room. <coughs> I lost my voice in the first service. Hallelujah. But to believe otherwise is a big mistake. In fact, it's a demonic lie because it robs us of everything that we have in Christ. So Romans 14, verse 10 and verse 12 says this. Um, well, I've got a lot of scriptures, so you can write them down and look them up um, as you go. So Romans 14, 10 and 12 says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says... For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is not about sin. If your sin is forgiven, it's forgiven. The judgment seat of Christ is about what you did with your life. In some, uh, tr some translations, it's called works. In other translations, it's called deeds. But it's about how you lived your life as a Christian. 1 Corinthians 3.13-15 says, Each one's work will become clear for the day, and it's the same day, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on, it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as, through fire. Now, there's many, many scriptures in the New Testament that talks about this. But let me, let me remind you of the prodigal son 
The prodigal son grew up in his father's house. He was born in his father's house. He didn't have a choice where he was born, how he was born, and how that happened. It happened, and he found himself in his father's house. You, you accept that? Where you were born, you didn't have any choice about that. It happened. He was born in his father's house. Being in his father's house, he became a recipient of everything his father had. He had his father's grace. He had his father's authority. He had his father's wealth. He had everything that was available in his father's house. Now, would you agree with me that everything that was available to him was a gift from the father because it wasn't his, but his dad allowed him to live in that, right? So living in that place, he had every privilege that you could think of. But then one day he decides, I'm going to take the things, <coughs> I'm going to take the things that my dad has made available to me, and I'm going to go and live my life somewhere else and enjoy the, those things outside of my father's, uh, my father's influence, my father's life, my father's place. So he goes and he applies himself with the things that he did not get because of himself, but his father's grace provided for him, he goes and lives that in his own way. Now that, I believe, is a dishonor when we use the things that somebody has given us for purposes that it wasn't given for in the first place. Does that make sense? So I want to touch on another one. Jesus spoke about this in so many different ways in Scripture. But I picked this one for us to just jump on a little bit today. It's found in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 19. You still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to the other one two, the other one one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more. Uh, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground. We're supposed to live above ground dug it in the ground, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. We are meant to keep it above ground. We are meant to live above ground. We are meant to live above, not below. And so we find in this story that it seems pretty interesting and I feel God strongly saying that he says, I gave you some stuff in your life. Now, often when people preach about this message, they preach about money, but I'm not going to preach about money today. I want to talk about your life and how you live your life. Because it says here yeah, that I am coming back soon and will be settling accounts with you. I will be coming back soon. We had a word at the end of the service last week saying, God say, I'm coming back soon. Now, you can believe that or you can't believe that. But here's the problem we have is we find in Scripture that we live in grace and we live in love and we live in all of these things. And we can quickly start to think that that means I can live my life any way I want and I'll never have to give an account for how I live. But Scripture says there will come a day where every single one of us will be found in front or standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the problem with the judgment seat of Christ is that there are no juries in heaven. You know, when you have a jury trial, you have a bunch of your peers on, on a stand, and if you, if you can find a, a story that can touch somebody's heart or you can convince them about how tough life is or somehow you can get one or two jurors to, to feel for you or to understand you were under, under, under duress or you were under the influence or something was going on and some jurors can feel sorry for you and then they might let you off. Or if you can come up with a good enough reason that I was struggling, I didn't have this and I didn't have a house and I didn't have a place to stay, then maybe somebody would feel sorry for you. But in heaven, there's no jury. There's only one. And he's supreme. And he holds us to a standard that Jesus never let us go of. And in verse 25, we find this. Oh, sorry, verse 30, it says, And cast the unprofitable servant into, the out, into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I'm not going to go into that. But from this and many others, we find that Jesus clearly presents 
that God is looking for his servants to be profitable. God's looking for our lives to be profitable. And God can only depend on you when you depend on him. Because if you don't depend on him, you don't have the strength and the ability and and the way to be successful. You cannot do it in your own strength. So God can only depend on you when you depend on him. So we have to keep it above ground. Something else that strikes me very interesting in this story is you notice there that nothing in this story indicates how old these servants were. Nothing indicates whether they were male or female. Nothing indicates whether they were rich or poor. Nothing indicates whether they were well or not well, healthy, not healthy, problems or no problems. Absolutely nothing is spoken of to define or to describe what these, these people looked like other than one word, they were servants. They were servants, and to each had been given according to their ability, which means is that they didn't all get the same, but they all got got what was according to their ability to do. That's interesting. So what Jesus is talking about here is not that everybody will, will be held to exactly the same criteria, but we will all be held to the same standard. Does that make sense? It's about the anointing and the faithfulness. Where are you today? What talents do you have? What do you have in your life right now that God has given you, that God's put in your life that you have buried into the ground? What is there right now in your walk and your life with God that you're saying this is not completely yielded to God? Because the truth of the reality is that the Lord has gone away. And he will be coming back. The clock is already ticking. What are you doing with the stuff that's in your life? Now I want to present you four thoughts on this today that you would not have thought I'm talking about when I mentioned talents. So there's a a left out of left field approach. I'm not talking about the things you, you, you would have wanted me or thought that I would be talking about. The first thing that I feel God is saying to me is that breath is meant for praise. What better way to honor the one who gave you breath than give him the breath back? What better way to honor God for giving you enough breath to get out of bed this morning than to honor him with that breath? Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It doesn't say let the worship team praise the Lord. It doesn't say let the young praise the Lord. It doesn't say let the old praise the Lord. It doesn't say if you have your ducks in a row, you praise the Lord. If everything's going well, you praise the Lord. If It doesn't say anything other than let everything praise the Lord. So in Scripture, there's no place where we are excluded from praising God. In fact, the only thing that we need, the only qualification you need to praise and to worship God is breath. You literally only need to be able to breathe to worship God. Does that make sense? That means that all you need to proclaim faith is breath. All that you need to declare God's power is breath. That same breath that you use to speak death. The same breath that you would use to declare something uh, doubtful. The same breath that you would gossip with. The the same breath that you would tear down your brother or your sister. The same breath that you would do horrible things and be negative and, and, and gossipy. Is the same breath that you can use to proclaim God, to declare His glory, to to sing His praises, to discharge supernatural power. Same breath. Last week in preparing my message, this scripture came to me, and I, I, I did mention it slightly, but I feel God wants me to say it again, because this will shake your world. Matthew 12, verse 36, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men will speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. You want to read that slowly? Every word that a man speaks, every word, does does that worry you? It worries me. 
every word. God is going to hold us to every single word that we spoke. That's, uh, that's a bit crazy, isn't it? Every day, you wake up with breath in your lungs. If you didn't wake up, then you wouldn't worry about it because you wouldn't be here. But every day you wake up with breath in your lungs is a day of opportunity. It's a day of privilege. It's a day of, of greatness. It's a day you can make a difference for God. It's a day you can lift somebody up, encourage somebody, build somebody up. Every day you wake up with breath in your lungs. What you use that breath for makes a difference because there comes a day where you do not wake up. There comes a day when there is no more breath in your lungs. And God will say, what did you do with the breath that I gave you? What will you say on that day? Would you say, I put my breath into fear or I put my breath into faith? What, did you say, what would you say to God you did with the breath that He blessed your life with? I feel this is very, very real. This is much deeper than me talking to you about money. This is much deeper than me to talking to you about something of this and something of that. This is a much deeper thing. What are you doing with the very breath that God has gifted you with this morning? Because that's what he's going to ask you. What did you do? It's interesting to me that all it took on the seventh day of walking around a city with a high wall was to open your mouth and use that breath and the walls came tumbling down. It's interesting to me that Jesus said all you need to tell that mountain to be moved from where it is and be cast in the sea is to open your mouth and let faith take a hold of your breath. It's interesting to me when Paul and Silas were in a prison, locked up in shackles, could not get out, that all they needed to do was pray and praise and worship God, and those shackles fell off the prison doors wide open. What are you using your breath for today? Because God's going to ask you, what did you do with that breath? The second thing that came to my mind his power is meant for change. Power is meant for change. You know what? We are not meant. We weren't designed. We weren't created to just take up space. You weren't just created to just exist for a time and then just fall away and have no purpose with your life. God made you for a purpose, yet so many people just exist. Just exist. If I can just live long enough to die. Serious. And yet God says, no, I made you for fruitfulness. I made you for authority. I made you for kingdom. I made you for a purpose. Amen. See, when the anointing of God comes upon your life, it means the Holy Spirit takes residence within you. And when that Holy Spirit is released in you, He releases power. You know why the Holy Spirit is there? For many, many reasons. But the Holy Spirit is the voice of God in your heart. He's there to prompt you, to spur you, to enable you. He's there to help you understand what the way of the Lord is. He's, he's there to show you what to do and how to do it and how to walk out your life. The Holy Spirit isn't just some long-distance friend hanging out somewhere in the background. He's meant to walk with you in power and authority to release all that God has for you. Amen? What happened on the day of Pentecost changed this world, and it needed to change you too. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 7 to 8, He says, this is what is expected of you. Preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. What is God going to ask you? What did you do with the Holy Spirit? Did you preach? Did you heal? Did you cast out? Did you, uh, uh, did you cleanse? Did you raise up? What did you do? What did you do with the power? Now look at this. Right now in heaven, all of heaven, angels and whoever else is available are sitting at the edge of their seats. And they're looking at you, Kenneth. And they're saying, that guy, that guy, he has the same spirit that was on Jesus Christ. That guy, he has the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That guy, he has all of that in him. I wonder what he's going to do today. 
I wonder what he's going to do today with all of that available. You see, without God, everything is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's within you. Jesus said, the things that I did, and greater than these you will do. Not because you're so great, but because His Holy Spirit has empowered you to do those things. Amen? Are you filled with the Spirit? If you're filled with the Spirit, God's going to ask you, what did you do with my Holy Spirit that I gifted you? Amen. Light is meant for hope. This is a tough one, because often light and salt are spoken about together, but they, they need to fit together. But Jesus said it matters. It matters how much light comes out of you. Jesus said it matters whether your light shines. It matters whether people can see my light in you. But yet, I, I wonder how many Christians, how many Christians are like floodlights, fog lights, that are just a candle, the candle in the wind, <laughs> Amen. just flickering along when we should be there, shining brightly. How many of us are meant to be lighthouses, pointing people out of danger and showing them the way home? How many of us are like fireworks, but we're afraid of the match that puts us in a place where we actually can do what we were made to do? You see, we've been given all of that in God. What are you doing with it? God has given you His glory, His love, His grace. Last night as we were driving up the southern outlet, I, I put my lights on high beam just for a moment. And you know what? It just lit up that whole area. It was, and it just in that moment, I just realized, God says, I put high beams on your life. I put high beams on your life. You were meant to shine a light in the darkness. Because there are people right now that are stuck in the darkness. There are people right now that are staggering in the dark, not knowing where to go and what to do. There are people today that are running into, bumping into things in the night they shouldn't be bumping into. And if you would just shine a light so they can see what's going on, they would see Him. But we like our basket. We like the basket that hides the light. And God says, no, I'm going to hold you. I'm going to ask you. What did you do with the light that I gave you? You are not called to be stepped on in the dark. You are called to scatter, to overthrow, and to destroy darkness. That's your call, your purpose. You know, the Samaritan woman we find in, in John 4, she encounters Jesus at the well. He tells her about her life. Then he tells her, I'm the living water. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. And then he tells her that God loves her. And in that moment, she comes so taken up by this message, this Jesus that she met. She runs into the village and she starts telling everybody about this Jesus she just met at the well. And I thought about it like this. You know, so many times people say, oh, I can't share my light. I can't share my testimony. I can't tell people about Jesus. I, I need to go to a class. I need this class. I need an evangelism school. I need to go to this. I need to go to that. And, and those things are fine. I'm not saying we shouldn't have those things. But why do you need to go to a class to tell people about Jesus Christ? When I met my wife and I fell in love with her, it didn't take me going to a class to figure out how to tell people that I fell in love with the most beautiful woman I've met in my life and that I just can't, can't take it. I needed to tell everybody about it. I didn't need to go to a class or somebody to tell me how to tell people I love my wife. When you meet Jesus Christ, you shouldn't have to go to a class to tell people what He did for your life. He gave you a testimony and that testimony is your love story. And if you can tell people your love story, they will see your light. Amen. Amen. What is wrong with us? We've forgotten our testimony. The testimony is light and power to those who need it. Amen. Amen. Every born again, saved believer has a light. It's only people who don't have Jesus that don't have a light. What are you doing with the light that you have? You've got to let it shine. You've got to let it shine. The time is short. The time is here. We have to start taking the baskets off our head and letting the light of God touch this world. Amen? God will want to know, what did you do with my light? And there's so many things I could add to this list. So many things. I want to stop with the last one here. Faith is meant for use. Jesus 
gave us so much. But in Romans 12, Paul tells us that we were each given a measure of faith. Even salvation, you wouldn't have enough faith if God hadn't first given you the gift of faith. You realize that? That God has given each one of us a measure of faith. And that faith is required to be used, to be exercised, to be worked, to be stretched, to be allowed to develop. What are you doing with your faith right now? See, when you walk by faith, that honors God. But when you don't walk by faith, it's the opposite. God desires us to walk by faith. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him completely? Who do you run to when you have a problem in your life? Where do you go when sickness falls on your body? Where do you go when trouble comes? Are you walking by faith? I'm not saying you shouldn't go and see doctors and bank managers and lawyers or whoever else you need to see, but are you running to them before you run to God? Are you seeking their counsel before you get God's counsel? Come on, I was speaking to a guy the other day and he didn't know how to make an investment and he's speaking to all kinds of worldly people about how to make an investment. I said to him, have you even asked God? Have you even asked God? See, we're meant to walk by faith. That means we ask him first. And then we can seek counsel from others because they will either confirm or deny what God has already put in your heart. God's going to ask you, what did you do with the faith that I gave you? What did you bury? Where did you bury it? I want to bring this message to a close because I want to allow some, some ministry time. So if I can ask the musicians to come. See, there's, this, this message is not a milk message for people who are not really walking in maturity yet. This is a meat message because mature Christians understand this. There is nothing you can do there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. Do you realize that? There's absolutely nothing that you can do to make God love you more. God loves you as much as, I mean, He already loves you so much that there's just no comparison. He doesn't just love you because you're good. He even loves you when you're not good. He loves you when you're up. He loves you when you're down. He loves you when you're in trouble, and He loves you when you're not in trouble. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. But there is something we can do to help us love Him more. Because you see, the problem often isn't the fact that God should love us. He, is, he does. The problem is we have forgotten how to love Him. And that's why the talent story is so important. Because if you loved Him, you would give Him your breath. If you loved Him, if you loved Him, you would give Him, you would give Him, you would give Him. See, He gave us already. God first loved that He gave. You have the Holy Spirit within you. You have the light of God. You have faith. You have love. You have grace. I could have made this list very, very long. See, often people talk about this in order to take an offering. But I'm saying this is not about an offering. Because if you get so stuck on an offering, you have forgotten your God because He's my source and my supply. Everything comes from Him. And that's the problem. We've grown into a place where we've forgotten that God... Uh, here's the thing. Uh, come on. Here's an example for you. If I work at the bank, right? I work at the bank. People come into the bank. What do they want from me? They're either going to want money from me or they're going to want to give me money. Isn't that what you do at the bank, mostly? To receive money or to give money. Now, if I do that, I'm doing my job, isn't it? What do you think will happen if I decide at the end of the day, well, I've given a lot of people money, I might as well take a few grand for myself. I'm still taking money and giving money. See, sometimes we've forgotten who we are as the older son. We are responsible for the father's business and we've been putting money in our pockets that shouldn't have been. Sorry, I have to say that. 
because that's often what we get stuck on. But it's never about the money because you wouldn't have stolen if you already ha- if you didn't already have a heart to steal. Isn't that true? You're, you have the heart to steal first before you steal. 